This is class number one of <clears throat> Tabernacle Two. R R three, R four, if you include the priesthood. Or the the feasts or the offerings, because I've taught all of those independently. <clears throat> all right, this is Tabernacle, whatever the number is. And uh this one we're going to be talking more about the um, furniture, which I don't think I've done since the original one that I did, like when I was your age. <laughs> and uh, also, we do have this book. Has anybody done any work in it? Raise your hand if you have. Good, one person, that's great. Okay, <clears throat> now remember I said you can work ahead, not behind <laughs> all right there therefore homework for next semester i mean for this class will be doing the questions on Chapters one, two, and three by next class. And the, the questions are in the back. They have the scripture references. It's not that hard. Um, that's right. <clears throat> Actually, the truth is, I'm depending on how the Lord leads tonight, I would be on chapter 11 by the first class. That's kind of the way I do it. Um, Deb, can you get me either a box of tissues or a semblance thereof, which should include at least four, just in case. I'm just glad my mustache is growing a lot better now that I, never mind. Now that I'm feeding it. <laughs> All right, let us begin with uh, Hebrews chapter 1. I'm in chapter 10, verse 1. Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, 1, for the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. All right, so we have, we're immediately confronted with two testaments. Testament, known universally as the OT, and the New Testament, also new, known universally as the NT. This scripture is talking about those two. It's talking about the law having a shadow of good things to come. And so what it is declaring unto you and unto me is, it is pointing the old covenant, um, is pointing to something better to come. All right. So that makes sense, and that doesn't seem too difficult at this stage. But it says that the law having a shadow. And so one thing that we have to realize is that there is this aspect of the Lord uh, and of knowing him that relates to, I'm going to take this off right here, relates to shadow. The shadow. Now, 
You know, I think that we pretty much feel comfortable with our knowledge that the old covenant was a shadow of, the, of what was to come. Usually we say it was a shadow of the new covenant. But this really isn't saying that, not this verse. For the law was a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things. And so it's dealing with, it's dealing with image. The image of it is not, not fully seen. And you know, with a shadow, a shadow of your hand or of your body, it's not a very good image at all. It's really more of an outline or a silhouette, actually, if we want to be technical. Um, <clears throat> and so um, there is this, this looking at things within the realm of earth, within the realm of a period of time from here to there, this covering this period and this covering that period. But let's go to uh, Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5 now. And I hope y'all will excuse me if I am doing this while you're turning. Verse 8, verse 5. Who serve unto the example and shadow who serve unto the example and shadow of heavenly things. As Moses was admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. So this is one reason why we're reading these scriptures and going over this because we're talking about the tabernacle. <clears throat> For see, saith he, this is, this is God speaking to Moses. This is God speaking. And this is what God has to say. For see that thou make all things according to the pattern shown thee in the mount. All right. So we have on our board a straight line with what we had the old Testament shadow over here and then we, right here at this point in time we have the New Testament <clears throat> but this verse is bringing in something else than the Old and the New Testament or the Old and the New Covenant. This verse is going beyond the other verse that we read and it is trying to awaken us and, and should, should, Lord willing, help us to be awakened to seeing the tabernacle beyond just things that, well, that's, that's a type of Christ that, because that looks like this and that. And, you know, they killed this, so it's got to be Jesus. You know, I mean, I stumped my toe and that's got to be a picture of Christ somehow. No, no, there's... There is some, there is a reality that is above the tabernacle, that is above the old covenant, that is above the new covenant, that is above all that, that we understand. That, you know, if we call it heavenly things, if we call it things above, if we call it the pattern that you saw on the mount, and really, I mean, what Moses saw on the mount was God face to face. All right. So that thing, and, and we're going to, I'm going to go ahead and round this out a little bit now. Uh, I'm going to use one of my famous abstract objects. covenant, just as I erase the old covenant, put shadow, and I'm going to put manifestation, okay? So here we have 
Um, throughout the book of Hebrews, we have these three things mentioned. We have the old covenant and the new covenant. We have the old covenant as a shadow. We have not yet described the new covenant yet, um, except as manifestation. And we're going to call this thing that is above, this thing that is... Um, uh, that the path, that the shadow was supposed to form after. We're going to call that, and I gave it a, an abstract shape, lest I put a circle and call it God and fail to take you down a road that will help you to know and enter into the Lord in this way. So we're going to call this one being, being, <clears throat> it's not only a state of being, it's a person who is a being, okay? And when Jesus came to the earth, Jesus, well, let's see if we can find a scripture that'll that'll do that, For probably uh, John chapter 1, because so much of John 1. Uh, well, let's, yeah, let's just take, um, we're going to be going back and forth to John maybe a lot possibly, so you might want to mark that. But in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, Okay. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. All right. All things were made by him. Now, there's another word that, that John uses, and it's logos. And that word has been translated word, but I fear that it has missed many of the points, because if this represents the being that created all things, that we call God, and therefore with God comes all of these um, images and thoughts, and this is what God, well, who is God? Well, and we start naming off all this stuff when most of the time we don't know that being. We know, we know what he does. We can almost say we've met the person, but we don't know the being of the person. And so then, let me see if, I've, if I'm also correct over here from our brother John. My Bible is starting to fall apart. Every page is... Okay, let's go. Now, keep your place in the Gospel of John because we're going to be looking at several things. 1 John chapter 1, and beginning with verse 1, that which was from the beginning. Okay. From the beginning. This is what's from the beginning. Now, we're still trying to identify or, or at least place where this should be placed, not along a linear line of history, not, a, not within a line of a movement from Old Covenant to New Covenant, but something outside of that, which we just read, it's all made by this being, this logos, this being. And um, so in 1 John, Verse 1, that which was from the beginning which we have heard. And what he's saying here is he has not heard Jesus of Nazareth. Do you understand the difference? He has not heard from Jesus of Nazareth. He has heard from that which was from the beginning. This is, if we don't get this, there's no need talking about the tabernacle because the tabernacle was not a, a shadow of the new It was the shadow of something above. And 
We'll miss it, we'll miss it, we'll miss it. We'll never see the being in it then. We'll only see how it fulfills New Testament concepts. Okay. So, but I'm not finished reading here because it's so good. Uh, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the logos of life. Okay. Keeping it on being right now. But the logos of life. But then it goes on. For the life was, here it is. Here it is. Now, if you get this, this will be so good for you. If, you, if, you, if you're not catching any of this, it's just going to be so sad. Which was manifested. Okay, so we got the cross over here under manifestation. And we got, let's see, how we draw that. We got the altar, and the fire on the altar. Or you could even make this the, the whole tabernacle over here in shadow. Shadow, tabernacle, altar. But, but altar is, is also very good, though it's not confined to altar, neither is the tabernacle. Because the altar and the laver and all of those different pieces of furniture were patterned after this being that was before, that was in the beginning, that made all things, and now we're making stuff in Shadowland after that image, but not the very direct image, it goes on to say. It's not the, the exact image, it is a made image of what we have seen. All right, so, um, so, so the cross, I mean, let's look at that again. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen, which we have, uh, with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life for the life was manifested. The life of the being called Logos was manifested down here at this time in the era that we call the time of the New Testament or the time of the New Covenant. All right. But this being was long before there was an era of the New Covenant or an era of the Old Covenant. And Jesus, the scriptures say of Jesus in Hebrews and many other places, he is the express image of this being. Now, probably if I draw this triangle any time again, I'm going to draw it in a different shape up here. I'm going to use, because we're, we're not capable of truly knowing because we are finite beings. Our understanding is finite. And each of us have an understanding not based on one book, and I'm just saying if, if it was a whatever book, not, not based on one book or one, but we have various um, upbringings and various teachings and various things, so much so that whatever comes to us is graded and marked and quantified and put together according to us. Not according to him, and it couldn't possibly be according to him because we don't know the being of him. Oh, but we know the manifestation, so that's knowing everything. That's what we think, but not true. The being manifested through Jesus. Okay, so manifestation. Manifestation is only the giving outward expression into the material realm of something that came from that being. Am I right or wrong? I mean, we haven't got very far here. I don't need to, you know, if I need to start 
and go over this again because this is the foundation, not just of the tabernacle, this is the foundation of everything. This is, this is whether we know God, the God of the shadow, or the God of the manifestation. Or the one that we're not even prepared to call God. I mean, not that he's not, but that we're not prepared to call him God because that will immediately slip into the things that we've quantified as what we understand of him. So we just call him a being. A being. All right. So this is... Let me just go over a few things, because most of this I wrote today. Actually, I wrote it in my sleep last night. I went to bed, and the Holy Spirit said, forget everything that you, you were thinking about sharing. And I said, it's tomorrow. <laughs> it starts tomorrow. He said, don't worry about it. So he kept, he, I mean, he didn't keep me up. He just moved all night long. And I'm telling you that what I'm sharing with you is what I heard from him that he wanted shared and that what he wanted us to, to, I mean, what is this, what is this, just this stupid chalk on a, on a board, what is that, what would that mean? That would mean that everything that we call God and understand to be God is only really and truly the manifestation of God and not the very being himself, not the very image himself. Do you see a difference between something, I mean, you know, I've used the example that, you know, I could be a carpenter and I could make beautiful woodwork and coffee tables and bedsteads and all this kind of stuff, you know, and you could come and, you know, once every six months look around in my little shop and go, oh, the, oh, the work. Oh, it's beautiful, you know, and your, your handiwork is so good and whatever. And I could, you know, when you're not there and the shop's closed up, I could be in the back beating my wife, you know what I mean? Same thing with a musician. Somebody could be really, really good and really, really ugly on the inside. And you would say, well, the, you know, this is proving what they are. But you can't know fully anybody by their manifestations, especially, especially people, especially people. Because <laughs> we have learned how to slip and slide and cover and, 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 you know, make look another way. And, you know, I mean, Again, and I, I, I guess I will probably be known as the preacher who hated Facebook. I don't hate Facebook. I hate, I hate people. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, not really. But I hate what people do because everybody puts this, I mean, they get the most gorgeous or best looking picture they can of themselves and they put it on there and they write all the good stuff about them. And they don't say, you know, you know, deep down, I really hate my or this or that. They don't put any of that stuff. They don't put it right on there. This is how you can know me, you know? And then what, what we continually fill it with is pictures of all the good moments. And we write about all the good stuff. Is there ever a period in there in any of these lives they go through anything? <laughs> you don't see it. Especially not to the degree that, you know, well, I'd, you know, I'm a liar and a mess. You know what I mean? You, know, you don't see that. Well, I'm a liar and a mess. You go, they, this person who did this to me is a liar and a mess. See? Okay, so, so we don't even know who we are because we've covered it over with so much stuff. And we think we do. Okay. Well, we're never really going to know who we are until we know who he is. Yeah. And yes, we will learn of him through Jesus, but there is 
because he's one with him. And he's not just one with him, he's one as part of what this being is, 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 okay? So, so let's talk about manifestation or, or what we know or, or what we can uh, derive from looking at manifestation in, in light of this, this triangle. <clears throat> I wrote down manifestation needs shadow. Okay. Manifestation needs shadow? No, it doesn't. Manifestation didn't need it. Shadow's just a shadow. Okay, well, let's, let's picture this, okay? Let's picture that um, soon as Jesus, now try to follow this, as soon as Jesus died on the cross, uh, and then Gentiles got a hold of it, um, they... The Gentiles killed every Jew and burnt everything that ever pertained to a Jew. Okay? Let's, let's just say that happened. All right, so people are saying, well, you know, there's this, this guy who died on the cross, you know, and so they go look and they're looking at him and they go, well, he's just a criminal. Yeah, I guess he is, because there's nothing evident. If you don't have any other information from the Old Covenant, from the shadow, if you have no zero, if you have zero information, then he's just a criminal that died on a, on a cross, like a bunch of other criminals, thousands upon thousands. There's nothing to relate that to. But when you take the manifestation back to the shadow, the manifestation back to the shadow, the shadow tells us of sacrifices that died, and he is the fulfillment of that. But if you never knew the shadow, you would have no clue what really happened. The manifestation needs the shadow because God explained it that way and put it that way so that when he died on a cross, he didn't say, I am the sacrifice for all men and I, you know, <laughs> and had, you know, a three hour speech so that we would all, you know, write it down and go, okay, oh, that's, that's what this is about. The manifestation needs the shadow. And apparently the writer of the book of Hebrews kind of thought that too. Because he's constantly pointing back to it, things that Gentiles didn't know normally. All right. Um, and I wrote down in parentheses, offerings explain the cross. Offerings explain the cross. The cross does not explain itself, people. <laughs> it, it doesn't. There is no explanation in the New Testament about the cross unless it is referring back to the Old Covenant. That he was an atonement for sin, that he gave himself, that we might da 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 da. And they're constantly referring to the shadow to put meat on the manifestation. Okay. The shadow, so let's talk about the shadow then. The shadow needs being to exist. Okay. That's a simple one, isn't it? Isn't that simple enough? If the sun's shining there and I'm standing here and my shadow's over there, if I wasn't here and I didn't exist, the shadow could not exist. It needs being to even exist. It can't exist in a vacuum. And you say, why, why is that important? Or how is that important? Because, because we dump the shadow all the time. It, it would be like if the shadow was Jacob's ladder. You climb that ladder till you find the being. Because it's going to lead to it. It points to it. it, it 
there are things still that you can learn from the shadow about the being, but you can't get the full picture of the being without the being. Even manifestation can't give you the full picture. Something has to be revealed. And what, what is revealed? I mean, we'll get into this, but what is revealed? I'll tell you exactly what's revealed. What's behind the veil? That's what's revealed. That's what's revealed. And what is behind the veil? Well, God is behind that veil and everything else in the whole place is a shadow in some fashion or form of that being that's back there. And just, to, you know, yes. everything is a shadow, but the being that's in there is not a shadow. But yes, he is in there with an ark, and related to that is the mercy seat. with two cherub on, on either side of which I'm not ready to speak particularly. <laughs> Neither was the writer of Hebrews, so we're both going to bow out on that right now. <laughs> um, I don't know if I'm, I said it, but shadow needs manifestation to have meaning. <clears throat> um, the, the shadow is just a ethereal thing. You know, a shadow. You can't touch it. You can't hold it. You can't, you know. But a manifestation of the being of which the shadow came, it gives meaning. It's almost like this triangle yeah, it works, and it's one somehow. I don't know. <clears throat> All right, so let's talk about being. Being needs shadow. Being needs shadow. Oh, no, being can it just exist. But for us and for, for our finite whatever, because we're not going to just jump automatically into being, God has been a, a be. There's been this being all along, and we're still struggling to, to grasp. Being needs shadow to testify of being in shadow form. If that wasn't true, there would be no Book of Hebrews, and it certainly would. There would be no this class that you're in right now. It's a testimony. It testifies that there is something real. If somebody saw my shadow, and I was around the corner, but they could see my shadow, they could assume that somebody's around the corner. Right? Yeah. They go, okay, this is... This is proof. This is proof. So you understand shadows, right? Everybody understand shadow? Okay, let's see if you do. Everybody stand. Everybody stand. Okay, you can sit back down. A bunch of people are getting sleepy, and I just thought I'd wake you up a little bit. Tell you what, I'm sleepy too. The Lord kept me up with this. The Lord scrapped everything I was going to share, and He said, "I want to talk to you about eternal things, and I want I want you." And yeah, He was talking to me. I want you to to realize that there is that which the shadow is a shadow of, instead of a shadow of the new of the manifestation. In a certain sense. In a certain sense, manifestation is still a shadow of the being and it is not the very being himself. 
Okay, so being needs manifestation to testify of being as a cause. In other words, that being manifests, that being is the cause of the manifestation. It's like a shadow. The shadow testifies of the person there. The manifestation also testifies that there's a being that is above our being. I wrote, God's manifestations are straight out of his being. And this is, this is an important thing because this is different from us. Our manifestations are not usually a manifestation of our being. They're a manifestation of our soul or our mind or our will or a manifestation of what our body's going through. I got a tummy ache. I'm manifesting, you know. And we show all kind of stuff that doesn't come from our being. All kinds of stuff. This, this being here doesn't at all. Everything it does, thinks, says, moves, has to do with its being because this, this being's being is God. There's nothing higher or in charge of God. There's nothing motivating God but his being. Right? right? Pure being. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God. Okay, he's with God, but he's with God because he's logos. He's with God because he's being. In the beginning there was the word. He's with God. He made all things. Oh, boy. I don't know that we'll ever get to it in this class, but I'll get to it in my book. We're going to find out one day, unless God kills me soon. Excuse me, takes me. Whatever method, you know. We're going to find out that being created everything out of its being. Created everything out of its being. Didn't create anything out of something else. You know, like, you know, I can see Jesus talking to the Father. You know, the other day, this angel bumped into me, and I had a thought. Maybe, are you following that? That was some incident that caused him to say, well, let's add this to the creation or do this or something. But he, he's not motivated by that. Whether it's an angel bumping into him or a human being driving a nail into his hands, all emanates from his being. And he has no other God before him. Right? Again, if there was, if he went by the Ten Commandments or anything like that, that would be God because it would be over him. He, he doesn't. He has no other gods before him. He is pure in what he does and what he says and we may not always understand when I say pure so you have to understand the being there's no need there is no need even saying this stuff if you don't understand his being because it falls on deaf ears because we don't know what all things created by him means and what therefore to do that we would go, we would do what scientists and psychologists and everybody else has done. We would set out to study all the manifestations in shadows. Scholars, Bible scholars, they're doing it the same way as a scientist or psychologist or anybody else. It is, it is an, uh, an event-minded search, not a being-minded search. So, 
That's why when we read, um, when we read uh, that first verse that we read um, in Hebrews 10, for the law having a shadow of good things to come, so okay, we're going. The law was a shadow of good things. There's no being involved in that for us. If the being is involved, we, we slap a name on him. Lord, and we look to him with expectations of doing good things for us. We've already perverted the river right there. We polluted the river. As soon as we touch it, we pollute. There is a river that maketh glad the heart of God. There's a river that flows pure out of the Lamb, out of the throne, out of the the bride, New Jerusalem. Pure. It's pure, pure, crystal clear. And it brings healing and life to everything it touches because it's flowing out of being. Yeah. Praise God. But see, while he stays pure, we pervert him or we pollute the thing because we're, we have to, we seem to have to be in it, but not just in the equation. It has to be X plus Y plus over two da -da 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 equals me. You know? And I, it's about me. I'm going to get good things. Well, the other scripture we read is you're serving unto the example and shadow and you're not seeing that everything is made according to how he made it, the intention, the spirit behind he made it. And you're making stuff out, out of out of order, out of out of another mind, out of another spirit. Uh, you see that with the disciples walking along with Jesus and Jesus decides to pass through Samaria because why? Being moves him. Being is moving him toward Jerusalem where he's going to die. It's moving him toward Jerusalem. It says that. He passes through with the intention of going to Jerusalem to die. Samaritans don't get that. I don't understand that. All I understand is we've been snubbed. You know, you stopped along the way for the people in Babadubidi and Lipidastadi and all these other places. But when you got here, you act like we're foreigners. See, they've got their own, because the Samaritans, come on. They were a mixture between Israel and the Syrians and Assyria and I can't remember everybody. All of it. Yeah, they're just a, a big mixture. So... And the Jews, Jews, they were, they were pure. No, they weren't. No, they weren't. But the Samaritans, in this case, they've got, they have got um, things built into them. Hurt, rejection, pride, meanness. They got all kind of all kind of squirmy things on the inside of them. See, because when, you know, once you offend that person, then they, they bring up their arson. So they're all offended and upset with Jesus and the disciples because they are of the Jews are not Samaritans. They're going to protect Jesus because that's the right thing to do. No, it's still the opposite of his being. Yes. But at least they're scriptural. Should we rain down fire like um, uh, Elijah did? We're scriptural. And, and we want to be with you. And the only way we know to be with him is to be scriptural, not to be with the being. See, you can't be with someone unless it's with the being. 
Okay? So, so we say, well, I'm going to be scriptural. Well, the devil is scriptural. The Bible, you know, the Word of God says, cast yourself down from here and he will lift you up. He's, the devil's quoting the Word of God to Jesus. Jesus goes, oh, well, praise God. Yeah, that's right. Okay, I'm going to jump off the temple. Should I do a swan dive or just a belly flopper? No, Jesus knows. Uh, and I'll say it like this. Jesus knows who he is of, meaning the being. He knows. And, and part of the thing we'll get into in this thing is that he will, he will, before it's over with, glorify the being. He will. He will, he will not glorify him, him with going, glory to the being. He will glorify the being. Amen. So, the disciples, I mean, you know, they've only been like three and a half years with Jesus. It's, you know, it's about how long you go to Bible school. And so far what they've learned is... There's power in God. And I can show you in the word of God that God let Elijah call it down from him. And he said, you bet you, Elijah. And they're all convinced of everything but the being. Because they don't know what that meant. They see it in light of, you know, I had somebody messing with me once, and, uh, you know, I, I, if they ever really get to me, start getting to me, I'm going to ask God to call down fire from them, because that's scriptural. Okay, so they said, let's call down fire. And Jesus says to them, you don't know the scriptures, no. He didn't, he, didn't, he, he didn't say you don't know the scriptures. The Pharisees knew the scriptures. He said you don't know what spirit you're of. You don't know the being that you're of. Are they of it? Yes. Do they know it? No, they don't know what spirit they're of. Amen? So this, this, this whole thing has to do with what is it that is in the mount, if you will? What is it that is in that mount? What is, that's important, not how is Jesus the fulfillment of this Old Testament story? Oh, how? Holy Spirit, show me how the manifestation is a fulfillment of the shadow. Or show me how the shadow, you know, plays into what Jesus did in this instance when he manifested something in words or in deed. See, all of this is on earth. All of this, anybody can note the shadow as far as seeing in tangible form, the tabernacle or the altar. Anybody can see the manifestation. But not anybody can see the being. You say, well, you know, excuse me, Brother Randy, but, you know, the high priest did go in once a year behind the curtain. And he never saw the being, folks. He didn't. He didn't. He didn't. Because he was in there to fix the problems of the people that were out there. Did you hear what I just said? The very reason why we go to prayer. The very reason why we do certain things. And we miss, we constantly miss the being. You know, I... I'm sh do you, don't you think somebody ever came up to the high priest and said, so what's God look like? What's he, what's he look like? You know, 
Don't you think people came up to the disciples 15 years after Jesus had been crucified and says, what did he look like? Did he have blue eyes? Did he have, you know, did he have this and that? Did he have a big Jewish nose like us? Yeah, praise God. He did. I, I can guarantee it. He did. It's a good Jewish man. But there was no beauty that you desire. And that's, of course, talking about the cross. But the disciples never went there. They never wrote about it. Isn't that weird? I mean, that'd be, that's, see, it's not weird theologically, but when we think about it, we would go, well, I would ask, I would ask that. I would like to know that. <clears throat> Paul hit the nail on the head years later, and he said, we don't know one another after the flesh. We, we, we don't know Jesus after the flesh, though we once did, but we don't know him anymore. I also find it interesting that Paul wrote that, and Paul never walked with Jesus after the flesh. So there's a whole other level of knowing someone after the flesh than just what we would assume. All right, so so when it came to the shadow, God said, see that you make all things, see to it, that you make all things according to what you saw in the mount. Don't. Don't make shadows of things that are not from here, his be. Don't make stuff shadows of stuff that is on the earth. Shadows are good in a whole lot of ways, but if you get a big old shadow, it's not necessarily good. You rename it. Do you know what a big old shadow is? It's called when the sun's on the other side of the earth and we're all not in shadow, we're in darkness. Right? Y'all understand my okay here with the solar system teaching? <laughs> it's, it's not just a shadow, it's called darkness. And half of the earth is in darkness at that point. If you, like, for example, with Moses, if you can make shadows, and God said, I want you to do that. God wanted that old covenant to be based on shadows. But if you can do that, if, you, if it is possible for you to do that, there's only one requirement. You have to see the original. The thing from which the shadow comes. Right? That's all that's required. You have to see that. And then you can set about, but I can guarantee, see, that's why they always ran to Moses. Well, this happened, and that, what happened here, and all this kind of stuff. And he seemed to know and be able to navigate and negotiate all of the hard turns and stuff like that. Why was he able to do that? Well, he was the leader, and God gave him special insight into leadership. No. The being was revealed to him. And he could look at something and go, that's not after the pattern. Hello? Hello? He could look at all kind of stuff and go, that's not after the pattern. That's not, that's not, this isn't, that's not, that's not, this isn't. You know, yes, it is. This is all, this is all Christian. <laughs> this is all from God. I know it is. I know it is. It's not. It's not after the pattern. It, was, it, has, it has prayer in it. It includes prayer. So it's got to be of God. Uh, Buddhist pray. Hindus pray. Sinners pray. Is it after the image? Or is it just just 
religion. And you see what happened, and I'll just end with this, what happened was eventually, like in the prophets, God said, I hate your feasts, I hate your sweet savor offerings, I hate your all of this, I hate all this. And I remember when I read that in Bible school, I went, God, why do you hate all this stuff? You're the one who initiated it. I mean, I really did. I, I was like, you started this stuff. Don't be blaming us. And then the Holy Spirit went, come here, dummy. Let me talk to you. you know. And he began to show me. If that was being filled full, fulfilled, if that was being filled full, with this coming down into manifestation, then he would have accepted it. But because it had, even though it was the form he gave, the insides of it had been perverted. It had been corrupted. Because it had no, no light. It was all formed in darkness. I mean, first thing God said when everything was out, when confusion and without form and void, let there be light. Okay, let's begin. <laughs> so, all right, let's stop and take a break and we'll come back.